Okay, this, um, I'm going to go over the Cold War, or at least some hi highlights of the history of the Cold War. Um, these PowerPoint slides will be online, so you can um, go through the slides and take down notes. Um, okay, so first, what is the Cold War, right? So internationally, the Cold War was a global struggle between capitalist and communist states. When we think of um, the Cold War, we often think immediately about it being most fundamentally a conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States, two countries that were allies during World War II, but in the post-war uh, war period would jockey for influence and power around the world. The public rhetoric used by the U.S. government often did not mention the word capitalist, but rather emphasized that the U.S. government was on the side of freedom and democracy against the forces of, quote, totalitarianism, best represented by people like Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, and Mao Zedong, leader of the Chinese Communist Revolution, who helped to found the People's Republic of China in 1949. However, as we know, the rhetoric used by people in power is often not entirely reflective of reality. So U.S. foreign policy was often less about promoting freedom and democracy, and more about promoting U.S. interests abroad. And these and U.S. interests got translated as uh, corporate interests, American corporate interests, or capitalist, capitalist interests abroad. So just to underscore this point that um, the Cold War is not necessarily only about freedom and democracy, uh, but it's fundamentally about promoting um, U.S. economic or cap uh, interests abroad or capitalist interests abroad. So to give you one example, um, so South Africa, right, was capitalist. It was considered part of the free world during the Cold War, um, even though its white minority had deprived the black population of nearly all of their rights. But South Africa was on the side of, uh, was in the, in the, in the free world um, during the Cold War. So I think this demonstrates that the Cold War is not necessarily right just about uh, promoting freedom and democracy. Um, second, domestically, the Cold War is not just about um, repressing people with explicit communist part, uh, politics at home, that that was certainly part of it. The Cold War within the United States marked a period of extreme repression of civil liberties, right? the right to freedom of speech and association, rights that are enshrined in the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The Cold War in the U.S. also represented a conservative turn in U.S. politics and helps to explain um, the defeat of the welfare state in the years following um, the uh, World War II. Okay, so I'm going to go through the rest of this lecture rather quickly. Um, you can stop and start this, write down information on the slides. Um, I'm not going to... Uh, stay on each slide for very long. So in 1947, with the Truman Doctrine, the U.S. committed itself to preventing Soviet expansion around the world. There were um, two ways, uh, right, that the U.S. sought to enact an anti-communist politics around the world. First, uh, military aid and direct military intervention. Second, um, through economic aid to prevent poverty. The Marshall Plan, which was passed in 1947, is the best, uh, best represents the second way, right? Economic aid rather than only military aid to prevent the spread of um, communism. Then there's also the military aspect of the, aspect of the Cold War. NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is formed in 1949 as an anti-communist military alliance among European nations and the United States. So NATO um, represents the military aspect of the Cold War. It's formed in 1949. Even, even though this was a Cold War organization, military alliance during the Cold War, it continues to exist today, even though the Cold War um, ended. So NSC 68 is a report put out by the National Security Council in 1950. It said that the Cold War was an epic struggle between the idea of freedom and the idea of slavery under the grim oligarchy of the Kremlin. The Kremlin is sort of like the White House, right? So the Kremlin is um, in, so, uh, in the Soviet Union. NSC 68 emphasized military action over diplomatic action. 
It helped to spur dramatic increases in military spending and would shape U.S. foreign policy for the next 20 years. The Korean War often receives little attention, but it was the first major battle of the Cold War. In 1945, after um, the Second World War, Korea was divided into Soviet and American zones. There's communist North Korea and anti-communist South Korea, which was undemocratic but aligned politically with the United States. So in 1950, with the support of the Soviet Union, North Korea invaded South Korea in an attempt to combine the two countries into one communist state. So though the United Nations had authorized military action to get North Korea out of South Korea, the United States actually did most of the fighting. At the, as the war ended, um, North Korea and South Korea were intact. So um, it ended in 1953. Uh, the war lasted from 1950 to 1953. Approximately 3 million Korean and Chinese um, people were dead. There were about 50,000 um, Americans who died during the Korean War. So what happened in Guatemala in the 1950s provides um, a very telling example of how the U.S., the Cold War for the United States was not necessarily about promoting democracy. Um, the election... And in this case, the U.S. helped to actually oust, to um, overthrow a democratically elected uh, regime. So the election in 1950 of Jacobo Arbenz as president of Guatemala alarmed the U.S. government due to his connections with communists and fears about unfavorable policies his government would enact toward U.S. corporate interests in Guatemala. Uh, the United Fruit Com uh, Company, which we now know as Chiquita, in particular, had tremendous economic interests in Guatemala. This is a U.S.-based corporation. In fact, by the mid-1940s, Guatemalan banana plantations accounted for more than one quarter of all of United Fruit's production in Latin America. And in Guatemala, United Fruit was the single biggest, uh, largest landowner. So this U.S.-based corporation was the single largest landowner in Guatemala. The U.S. became alarmed when, in 1952, the Arbenz government enacted uh, an agrarian land reform program. Uh, 1,500,000 acres of uncultivated land were ultimately uh, redistributed to around 100,000 poor fa uh, families in an 18-month uh, period. The U.S. was very unhappy about this situation because uh, some of this land in, uh, belonged to United Fruit. United Fruit about, um, had a lot of land under its control that was uncultivated. So the um, Guatemalan government uh, took some of this land and redistributed it to poor families in Guatemala. Um, so angered by attacks on U.S. corporate interests, the CIA helped to orchestrate a coup in Guatemala, which resulted in the ouster of the president, a democratically elected president, Jacobo Arbenz, in 1954. So how do we know that the United States was involved in this? Um, the CIA documents made public in the 1970s under the Freedom of Information Act revealed in detail the CIA's orchestration of the Guatemalan uh, coup. So Arbenz was replaced by a military uh, junta and what's happening in 1954 sets the stage for the political violence in Guatemala in the 1970s and 1980s, a uh, topic we'll come back to later. So within U.S. borders, the Cold War resulted in the repression of communists and other leftists. It also produced a chilling effect on U.S. political culture, which helped to produce a culture of political uniformity and a fear of dissent. So all aspects of life would be uh, affected. The labor movement would expel communists in the late 1940s and throughout the 1950s, moving the labor movement to the right uh, politically. People were fired um, from their jobs on suspicion that they were communists. The movies changed, so uh, the Cold War affected popular culture. Gays and lesbians were targeted as security risks. So the Smith Act passed in 1940 uh, made it a federal crime to advocate, advise, or teach the necessity or desirability of overthrowing local, state, or the federal government by force. 
It also made belonging to any organization that promoted the overthrow of the government illegal. So this, at the beginning of this domestic repression of civil liberties in the United States, the Smith Act gets passed. And beginning in 1948, um, leaders of the Communist Party were convicted and imprisoned under the Smith Act. Okay, so um, in 19, let's see what else. I'm going to skip over some stuff here in my notes. So during McCarthyism, people who were charged with being communist or communist sympathizers were called before congressional hearings, both at the federal and the state level. At the um, national level, the federal level, the ha what uh, a committee called the House on American Activities Committee became notorious as the main committee uh, that persecu uh, persecuted subversives. Um, Senator Joe McCarthy helped to lead these witch hunts. This is why this period of domestic repression is called uh, McCarthyism. It's named after Senator Joe McCarthy, who led these witch hunts. So the House on American Activities Committee held 147 hearings at the federal level. Um, even before congressional hearings determined whether or not people were uh, actually members of the Communist Party, either current or former members of the Communist Party, employers, their employers blacklisted or fired them. So the black, understanding that um, the, uh, this period of McCarthyism, um, you, to understand this, you have to know something about the blacklist. So being on the blacklist meant that you were prohibited from working in um, the industry or job that you once had worked in. So it often didn't matter if, you, if it was ever proven that you had been a communist. The accusation enough was, uh, was enough to place you on the blacklist. So thousands of people, even people who are not called, uh, who don't testify ultimately before the House and American Activities Committee, um, are accused of being communists and they end up on a blacklist um, and they can't work these jobs anymore. So um, in the 1930s in particular, many people joined the Communist Party for uh, brief periods of time. So I want to talk about who was who was targeted, right? The Communist Party had its height in the 1930s, so a lot of people joined the Communist Party in the 1930s, um, and often for brief periods of time. So the party, after all, had helped to lead a variety of struggles for economic and social justice. So African Americans in the South saw the Communist Party as one way to promote racial justice. Uh, people left the Communist Party, they joined it because the Communist Party was doing some good work for social and economic justice, but also people left for a variety of reasons. So they left it because they were opposed to the rigid hierarchy of the Communist Party, while others left because they were critical of the support let, lent by the leadership of the Communist Party for the Soviet Union. Right, despite the re uh, revelations of human rights abuses by Stalin's regime. But during McCarthyism in the 1940s through the early 1960s, this is the height of McCarthyism, the 40s through the early 60s, ex-membership in the Communist Party did not necessarily protect people from persecution. Um, so in addition to leaders of the Communist people, uh, Party, the people who were targeted were Teachers and college faculty were targeted in, um, in depth. Actually, some of my research is all about the targeting of teachers in Los Angeles. Dozens of teachers were ultimately fired um, in L.A. and across the country for, um, after being accused of being uh, members of the Communist Party. Labor, uh, leaders of labor unions were targeted. Civil rights activists were targeted. People in Hollywood were targeted as well. Uh, gays and lesbians were targeted in what uh, came to be known as the Lavender scare. So as morally questionable people, um, gays and lesbians were supposedly security risks. They could be blackmailed into providing secrets to the Soviet Union, for instance, for fear of their homosexual homosexuality being exposed. So gay people were considered a threat to national security during the Cold War. Pressure mounted to such an extent that in June of 1950, the State Department authorized a formal inquiry into the employment of homosexuals, quote, homosexuals and other moral perverts in government. As a result, ultimately hundreds of people were fired from their positions in the federal government, government for being gay. So I'm going to skip over some of this stuff. 
um, and talk a little bit about the Hollywood 10. So in 1947, the house, um, these slides are going to be online too. Okay. So in 1947, the House Un-American Activities Committee launched a series of hearings about communist influence in Hollywood. So famous directors, actors, and screenwriters were called to appear before the committee. 41 people in total were called um, before the House on American Activities Committee. They were cited with um, contempt when they refused to testify. Um, they ended up serving jail time of six months to a year and were immediately fired from their jobs in Hollywood. So the Hollywood studios ultimately blacklisted them and more than 200 other people. Leftists, former mem members of the Communist Party, anybody who was accused of having any association with the Communist Party. Um, some members of the Hollywood 10, though, were able to find work in secret. For instance, Dalton Trumbo, Trumbo who's pictured here, um, he was a screenwriter and he wrote the screenplay for the movie Spartacus, uh, a movie released in 1960 about a slave revolt led by a slave, a slave named uh, Spartacus. He assumed um, uh, another name, so he didn't use his name. Uh, and he wrote many screenplays during this period under uh, other names. So there's a movie, a really great movie that came out in the last couple of years called Trumbo, all, all about Dalton Trumbo um, that you can watch. Also, I think Spartacus won the Oscar. So <laughs> it was written by somebody who the screenplay won the Oscar, I think. I could be wrong about that. But anyway, the, um, it won some sort of Oscar. This, it won an Oscar, but the person who had written the um, written the screenplay was not acknowledged for the fact that he did he was the he was the writer. So the um, the effect is a shift in uh, popular culture, especially in the movies. The Cold War completely changes the content of movies, um, strips them of content that could be interpreted as linked with uh, communism. So the new political messages are now running through movies that are not about worker struggles, they're not about anti-racism. They're now explicitly, um, there are many explicitly anti-communist movies that come out in this period. So you could go online and see the Hollywood 10 hearings. There's a clip of the Hollywood 10 hearings. Um, uh, so one of the people who was blacklisted is this man named Herbert J. Bieberman, and he directed this movie called Salt of the Earth, which is about, um, uh, Mexicans in, I think it's New Mexico, on strike in the late 1940s, early 1950s, something like that. So anyway, it's a really excellent uh, movie, and it goes to show that when you, um, right, when you blacklist people like her, this director, Herbert J. Bieberman, the content of Hollywood films are no longer going to be about things like workers collectively organizing for their rights. Um, so... To conclude, right, in the, um, we're going to continue to talk about the Cold War, right, when we, uh, specifically when we talk about the Vietnam War next week. And I just want to say that it's important to emphasize, as I did at the beginning, right, that the Cold War is not about freedom versus totalitarianism. In its desire to challenge socialism or communism around the world, the U.S. government supported um, democratic governments as well as dictatorships and it also became involved in deposing democratically elected governments if they were socialist. Domestically, manifestation of the Cold War was felt through domestic repression of civil liberties and through the blacklist. The 1940s and 1950s marked in particular an intense period um, of repression of political dissent and also a conservative turn in U.S. politics. By the 1960s, McCarthyism, McCarthyism was in decline, but the international Cold War was as strong as ever.